We welcome in our co-host, New York Times best-selling author John Gilstrap. John, good morning to you. Good morning. And Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matt Harvey. He has no jurisdiction in this studio. That's right. I'm out real, of his boundary. Uh, yeah, it's it's nice to have a break. Right. Our first guest uh, also outside of the jurisdiction of the city of Martinsburg. So the two of you can battle it out to find out who takes down Gilstrap when he eventually, and he will, break the law this morning during the show at some time. Well, it explains all the illegal activity that's going on in the studio today. Nobody has jurisdiction. Nobody can arrest anybody right He's now. Got, Chief's got good. a gun. Oh, I, I, I have him. a gun, and I could probably get a taser here pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> pretty quick. <laughs> I've got my attorney, Mr. Harvey, with me right he now. He has an attorney. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, also, and uh, coming up after uh, our first guest, you just heard his voice, Chief Aaron Gibbons. I will have uh, Sheriff Rob Blair in the uh, first hour here on the program. He'll be in at 835. Chief, good morning. Thanks so much for coming in today. I appreciate you having me on here this morning. I heard Matt's going to be here, so I couldn't help but follow his car around city, the city of Martinsburg a little bit this morning. What do you think about a My clean-shaven are... Matt Harvey? That's that's pretty nice. Huh? I, I haven't seen him like that in quite a while since he was over at the Berkeley County Courthouse. Yeah, you got to remember, Chief and I, we go way back. I used to be an assistant prosecutor, and he was a patrolman at mm-hmm. Martinsburg 19 years ago. So you had no beard back then? I, I couldn't grow a beard back then. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I always tried. I always appreciated going into the uh, into the courtroom and seeing Matt in there. I I really appreciated that. He, this guy, I love him. I can see that. Yeah, you got a huge smile on your face and you're blushing. Yeah, but he has a whole bunch of bunch of notes on that paper. I'm worried about him here in a it's, second. <laughs> it's just names. It's just names of the guests. No, just, just, yeah. just witnesses. Just witnesses. Just yeah, witnesses. Yeah. Just confessions. Yeah. That's all. Chief, I want to ask you about the physical security assessment program that uh, you have uh, put a press release out in regards to how it's going to be implemented in the community in the city of Martinsburg and such. Tell me about this and, and the need for it. So we've been wanting to do this for quite a while. The community's um, had quite a calling for security assessments on whether it's residential, places of worship, businesses, schools. Uh, we've had this idea floating around and we, we couldn't help but think of how to implement this. So we made some changes. I wanted to make some changes within the department. Uh, we have a very well-established command staff team, uh, command team. Uh, we have four lieutenants, captain, uh, deputy chief, and myself. Kind of made some moves around on shifts. Um, we put the four lieutenants through some certification training for security assessments. Where did you go to get that? Um, they went to, the, uh, I believe it was two different places. Uh, one was in Northern Virginia, and I believe uh, Lieutenant Allball is the only one left to still go. But the other three are already they actually just did one for St. Joe's School. Is that a one day? Yeah, uh, it's, it's yeah. one day. It's a one day thing. They come in, they do a security assessment, do an evaluation, and then they submit it um, to the organization that requested it. Okay. So what we do is there's a um, I on the press release I put out the contact information for Lieutenant Polinick. He's going to be the uh, he's pretty much going to spearhead this entire program. Uh, somebody will want a security assessment done just say for example here now we're not in city limits we're thinking of expanding it out to the county but we want to see what the calling is first sure. and so we don't get overwhelmed uh, you make contact with lieutenant, lieutenant Polinick. he schedules it with one of the lieutenants and they come out and do the actual assessment and these are going to be this assessment is going to be for security risks uh, almost like a threat assessment tor- type of situation. Uh, everything from, you know, you have too much glass on the front of this building, you have a secretary sitting right here, you have a lying in wait right outside your door, you have a bunch of bushes where somebody could hide, things like that. So where to put cameras, where to um, have uh, full steel doors possibly. So after you've done the assessment, do you come up with a plan then on how to rectify they, things? They assist the organization or the, um, the place of worship the, who, or even the resident. They assist them on ideas for getting that. They're going to be responsible for the sec- actual security measures. Um, we're just doing the assessment. Several police officers that live in my neighborhood of varying sorts, anywhere from uh, local to county to state to federal, and one thing they all agree on is you shouldn't have your shrubs in front of your house higher than the window because people can hide behind those when you're coming home. Yeah, walking they call in your that front lying door. in wait. Yeah, that's yeah. what you were referring to with lying in wait. Mr. Gilstrap. I'm just, it, 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 it's an interesting thought. 
we're in a place where people are are worried about these things. You know, you used to be you harden your house against burglars, and now we're hardening our our businesses against attackers. I, I guess. What is the in in your estimate? What's the most um, easily fixed it's sort of the smoke detector equivalent of of physical security in in a business taking a secretary out of the front and putting them behind a wall or something that that's expensive and, and takes a lot of time is what's what's the easiest thing that most people can do i think i think some of the easiest things that or the most pertinent things to think about is your escape route your escape plan how, if somebody were to come in that door and or you see them walking up to the door and you think that the propensity for violence is there, where are you going to go? So I think having an exit is one of the biggest factors. Cameras, I mean, they can be expensive, but they can also not be expensive. Um, making sure doors are locked or having some, some sort of access point to where you give them access to the building. There's all kinds of things that you can do other than just, hey, we're going to build a whole wall here and or take glass out and put in a wall. So I think, and what Rob was saying, you know, cut down the bushes in front of your in front of your place. You walk out, you walk out of your house, you walk out of your business, and um, who knows who could be sitting there just waiting. Is there a cost to citizens? No, no cost. You just make the call and uh, reach out to Lieutenant Polnick, and I find it amazing. I write about this stuff a lot, and the level of cluelessness of so many people who are, I guess, situational, situational awareness is, is what's coming to mind. They go through their life with their face buried in their phone or with the earbuds in and completely unaware. You could walk right up behind somebody and and do, and do they have no idea that they're there. It seems to me that, that just the, the personal awareness issue is, is a big deal. I used to work in DC and and that would be an issue. Situational awareness is is huge, you know, and it, you would not expect it to happen to any one of us, but it does. Just my wife last week, she's up at Aldi, she's shopping, she reaches down, pick up a can, somebody snatches the her wallet right out of her purse. No way. Oh, everything wow. gone. All the business cards, IDs, everything. Did you catch gone. the perp? No. I think they were traveling through. Uh, they tried to spend about three grand in Target. Went over to K Jewelers, all within a matter of about 20, 30 minutes. Tried to buy a big ring. And then we get a call later on that the same suspects, it appeared to be the same suspects, had uh, tried the same thing in Hagerstown. So we believe they were just tra traveling through. Wow. So, uh, so, so situational awareness, that's, that's huge. You know, watching out for each other. Um, being aware of your surroundings, who's and you know you can talk to somebody. For example, my wife; she was a police officer. You talk to somebody like my wife, who says, "I I didn't even see it coming. I knew that this guy, you know, I knew that there was a guy in there, and I knew that there was something wrong, but it just evaporated out of my mind at the at the wrong moment." Yeah, it gets hard to be you know on point all the time, mm -hmm. and just yeah. There's been a lot of shootings, it seems, in this area over the last month. Uh, by a lot, I guess anything more than one, anything more than zeros, uh, is a lot. Is there a, a particular trend that you're noticing or, or seeing in regards to anything that might tie these together? Or So it just so happens that uh, the shooting that we just had over here, at, uh, it was at the gardens. We had a shooting uh, a couple months ago up on Queen Street. And it just so happens we called in the ATF because we didn't have any suspects. We had some rounds, uh, some casings laying on the ground. And it just so happens that we're fairly certain that the same gun that was used at the gardens was from a shooting up on North Queen Street. So that's something we're working. Now, whether or not, so that just ties two together. Nobody was hit up on North Queen Street at that mm -hmm. time, but there have been several shootings throughout the past six months or so. Yeah. You know, we had the one in December, then another one in January and February. Um, those all, you know, those were all handled, but completely separated from each other. Um, one was at the domestic up there in Spring Mills. We had the other one up on uh, Queen Street, right across from the uh, city, city hall. And the other one where the guy collapsed right in front of the police department, trying to get to the police department. So, but before that, we had no shootings for, eight eight months or so 
So I, I think it's fairly ran it's it's fair to say that it's fairly random. Uh, but tying these all together, I, I couldn't do that. The governor had proposed building a uh, new lab in his state of the state address at the start of his final year uh, in office. Uh, what is the lab situation in regards with the work that you send, Aaron? I know a couple of years ago it was backed up quite a bit. It, I understand it then improved a bit. It has improved from what I have heard. Now, of course, I'm chief now, so I don't submit anything to the lab. But even Matt, Matt will agree that back in the day, getting something back from the crime lab would take sometimes eight months, six, seven, eight months. Sometimes you could push them a little bit for, for uh, evidence to come back. It has improved, um, so I, I will give them that. Um, unfortunately, everybody's understaffed under you know they they can't get the budgeting uh enough budgeting to pay people to be crime tech labs or uh crime lab techs um so how long should it take if you're trying to conduct an investigation well i don't work actually at the lab it depends on what you're using if you're if you're trying to get drugs back usually that that can be a little bit quicker but if you're trying to get dna or blood back um sexual assault kits they usually come back fairly quick um uh, it, it depends on what type of uh, evidence you're sending down there. But usually weapons and blood, that, that usually takes the longest. Uh, Matt, what's evidence. your experience been like? Anything? I think it's definitely improved since I've been in office. It, um, and the ability to kind of check in on, on seeing where, the, where, where drugs are at in the process um, with some technology upgrades at the lab has been a help. You know, a lot of, a lot of the problem or some of the problem was – prosecutors would submit evidence like drugs for example and then the case would plea out or get dismissed or resolve somehow and then they wouldn't tell the lab so they would still be in their queue to test and so a lot of those little like process issues have been worked out and um, I mean there still are issues but it's certainly improved um, in the last eight years well that's good news is it as efficient as it should be though it's well it, it's it's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's you, we have a lab serving the whole state, and it does it, at no cost to to our offices to submit stuff there. So I, I'm you know I'm not going to you know if if we need something really expedited, there are ways to get that done. And for I mean I, there's um, that could cost. For example, I don't want to say too much, but we had some lab uh, some testing expedited recently and at a small cost on some dna i think comparatively speaking to other states you know if 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 we're making a call for having each agency have their own individual uh crime techs and uh, uh lab techs one it would it would be a phenomenal amount of money and then what do you train them on mm -hmm. so this is one place that we can send all of our evidence whether it's tool marks whether it's blood evidence whether it's you know sending casings off to the um atf um and then somebody's got to testify and then somebody has to testify so, that so takes them out of the office to they do they uh, a lot of times they have to come in and testify as well for the evidence that they processed so having a a local I guess the only way around the state system would to be would to be have to have something in the panhandle, but then it, to what expense? You know, we're, we may be sacrificing a month by sending it off by to the West Virginia State Police Crime Lab, but at least they're very good at what they do. They come and testify and they process the evidence that we need. Are you has has the inefficiencies in the lab system where there are inefficiencies? Obviously, as you mentioned, some things aren't inefficient. But has any of that cost you a case or caused somebody to sit in jail longer than they should have? If there's been a – maybe it takes you two months to get something back that should take you a month? I, I somebody think with, sitting there when with they the way be? that the court system works now, I, well, and it has always worked, um, there's always – waiting for the evidence is crucial. You know, having that information back from the crime lab and whether it's going to take two or three months compared to seven, eight months, we'll wait and we'll we'll wait as long as we need to. Mm -hmm. Now, like Matt said, we can expedite it or put in a request to have it expedited and they'll see what they can do. Um, but I don't think that it has really uh, cost us a case 
that I can think of from the from it being late or not being mm -hmm. back. Um, Why would you want to expedite one over another when you when you're looking for evidence? Is is this to justify in order to make an arrest? You you, you want to make sure that you, you've got the right person, so therefore we we expedite the testing to to make the arrest or is this after somebody's arrested trying to figure out why we'd want to have there there could be a thousand different reasons why you'd want to expedite it yeah i think you're associating uh you know not having an arrest with us expediting evidence to prove that it was somebody that's that could very well be the case but in most cases we usually already have an arrest now if it's something for dna or we're trying to get a match back for dna that does take some time and sometimes we have to wait three or four months to actually effect an arrest for somebody that's that doesn't happen as often as sending off evidence for somebody that's already incarcerated and or out on bond so it's sort of a non sequitur, I guess. But is there any truth to the rumor that that these DNA sites like Twenty Three and Me and such have vastly expanded the DNA database to to find bad guys? I don't know if they're affiliated. <laughs> I don't. I don't know that they are. Okay. I, I just. I had heard that. that yeah. I, I. I mean, I would imagine. You know, all everybody's sending DNA to and these not Twenty Three and Me 20, per se. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Um, yes. You know, the answer is yes. It, it's it's become an, another tool that law enforcement can use. My brother-in-law's niece's wedding, a week before the wedding, was disrupted, delayed, when the DJ was arrested for murder <laughs> that he had committed, allegedly, 20 years previous because he did one of those 23andMe tests. His DNA turned up somehow in a lab somewhere where it was shared with a police department official who was investigating the case, matched the DNA to the DNA that had been at the murder scene, and the DJ was arrested 20 years later for the murder of a woman. I, that, I, don't, that's, that's I want amazing. to be clear. I'm not saying that there's a direct link. If you go to one of these commercial I, I know what you're, I know what you're and saying. submit your DNA, but it has that, it happened. Go, that goes to... <laughs> it, there, there's it's not they they don't get it and then automatically turn it over to law enforcement but Correct. it is a, a searchable database that law enforcement could subpoena and um use as a tool in this case it helps solve a murder 20 year old yeah. cold case 20 year old cold case imagine that and there's a lot yeah. of those being solved these days imagine getting something back from 23 and me oh you're part irish part uh american indian and you have warrants. <laughs> and they're not just parking tickets. And you're wanted in Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> and your results are delivered by well, a deputy. And it, <laughs> and Congratulations. And it, you've got some German heritage. And you're under arrest. Look, you're not. If, if, if I send my DNA in, and, and I have done that before in one of those sites. I can't remember which one it was. I can feel it's Ancestry or 23 or if they've merged the same thing. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have to be me. It can be a close relative mm -hmm. that will also, mm -hmm. you know, could 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 make that chain for Gee, you. We've got a couple of studio audience questions for you here from our Facebook group. And one of those is, will bicycle patrols resume in March? Yes. Park? So I am a bicycle guy. We've got a lot of bikes. Um, there's only about three of us left. Recruiting, one of the biggest one of the biggest issues that we've been dealing with is staffing. We were down to about 32 back in October of last year. And now we need... Well, we did need four four people, so we we came up. Our staffing level is fifty, mm -hmm. um, and we we came up to about forty six. We lost two in the academy, unfortunately, so that brought us down to we needed six, and then somebody retired. So, through attrition, we still need people, but we have a lot of real young guys that seem to be excited about the bike pro, uh, the bike program. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll get them certified, get them on a bike, get them riding around, and we'll, you'll see. As well as myself and my captain, we, we get on the bike quite often. I haven't really this year. It's been so busy. But um, you will see us out riding around. And anytime any of my guys are out riding around on the bikes, I get a text message. Hey, I just saw somebody riding a bike. I really appreciate you coming through the neighborhood. But I love being out on the bike. I really do. Because mm -hmm. once you get on that bike and you're riding down West Virginia Avenue or down Moeller, you can hear 
everything. You can hear everything for miles, one, two, three o'clock in the morning. You can hear everything that's happening. So I love being out on the bike. And yes, we we are, we do still have a bike program. Uh, we have a bunch of new guys. We're trying to get them through their first year of probation, and even before then, we can start getting them certified. The next question is: Martinsburg's drug house ordinance still enforced? And if so, why don't we hear about it anymore? Uh, the previous chief had. Um, Swartwood, he had he had changed the drug house ordinance up a little bit. Usually, whenever we have an issue with a house, and we have had plenty of issues with houses, we at least try to get in contact with the with the uh, homeowner and see how they're going to resolve this situation. So that's how the the drug house ordinance has changed. If they make if they take steps to actually change the residents, change who's staying in their apartments then we don't need to blast them all over the radio, all over the newspapers, as long as they're taking these steps to make those adjustments. If they're not making those adjustments, we give them a warning, we give them a time period, mm -hmm. and then if they, don't, if they don't adhere to that time period, now we're gonna blast them with the drug house ordinance. So that's, that's the change that we had. And what is the drug house ordinance? Uh, that's just steps that we take through um, I actually haven't had to do it yet. Um, we actually get the attorney involved, and if they could get fined, I believe they could get fined. Um, I I really don't know this. It's a nuisance abatement tool. Okay. Like if if drug, you know, a, drug problem, a problem drug house activity. Okay. They can yeah. shut it down. Repeated activity. Board it up. Shut it down. Find, yeah. They can find uh, basically take action against the landlord. Yeah. There was a big complaint with absentee landlords, uh, people who live out of state and weren't paying much attention to their properties a few years back. And the properties were getting run down. Uh, people were in the buildings were selling drugs. There's all kind of criminal activity going on around, and the landlord didn't seem to care because they were out of state as long as they were getting their rent on time. And this kind of spurred a lot of complaints and then eventually some action. From what I've noticed, that is one of the hardest things is just getting a hold of the land, the uh, mm. homeowner or the landlord. Yeah. About a minute left, Chief. And the final question is uh, the new apartment complex that's, uh, I guess they're starting to rent units out now. People moving in, uh, does that uh, create increased patrol uh, for you? Not necessarily as of yet. Um, I, I'd imagine that eventually it will. Um, right now, I believe that they... I did a walkthrough probably about a month ago, and I believe that they had already um, sold, uh, or they've already had maybe 40 or 50 yeah. applicants actually getting ready to move in. It looks like people are already moving in. It looked like they were almost finished with another 120 um, units. Uh, they're finishing up the project there on King Street. Hopefully that'll be open back up uh, either tomorrow or Monday or Tuesday, it depends on the rain. Um, so I don't necessarily think that we're going to have any issues with uh, or have to allocate anybody for extra patrols, but we will, you know, but it, it's dependent upon. So if we start getting calls, then we're going to have to do, we're going to have to enforce a little bit more uh, foot patrols through the building. But we are familiar with the building. Uh, we've been doing walkthroughs of the building, so we know the egress, ingress. Um, the situation there at the building but i don't i don't foresee as of yet unless it's the generalized call for like a domestic or mm -hmm. a disturbance or something like that chief thanks for coming by today i appreciate you very much good oh to see na you. national night out august 6th at war memorial park make sure everybody shows up we're gonna have hot dogs and i'm gonna try to get a dunk tank i'm trying to get somebody to get a dunk tank <laughs> i want to get in a dunk tank at national night out everybody wants to throw a softball at a chief of police so as hot as it's been dude you'll have a competition to get into that water <laughs> that's right uh, chief aaron gibbons with us and now we are back with